Paul, uh, on behalf of myself and uh, Kamrad Aftal, I extend a warm welcome to all the uh, doctors who are attending this uh, conference, mainly the uh, speaker of the day, my dear uh, <coughs> guide and teacher, Dr. M. T. Watson, and also the moderator of this uh, session, Dr. Anita and Dr. Sri, and of the panelists of the session, Dr. Rajika and Rajan from Shagan Australia, and uh, Dr. Uh, Srinivas Rao will be dying soon, and also Dr. Raven from Ayurveda uh, Hospital Prime too. And also all the ophthalmologists, I extend a warm welcome. Uh, of course, this uh, webinar I was uh, thinking for a long time, and also I was uh, when I was looking for a correct person, I thought MS will be the correct person because he knows uh, the thing for more than 40 years uh, how he approach a case of even simple case of uh, negativities or preparatives and the way in which we uh, treat and uh, uh, follow the patient is really is, uh, amazing and uh, nowadays uh, I you know very well because we know all about the recent advances in PECO or specular or vocal or so many other things in glaucoma etc but to be the basic things uh, most of the general ophthalmologists, even the PGs also, they don't know how to approach a case of a simple conjunctivities and uh, or a simple preparatives or selection. That uh, exposure and how to manage that case uh, is very, very, uh, they find it to be difficult because nowadays they, we have so many spectrum of antibiotics or anti allergic and uh, steroids, everything else they do and also ultimately say to you everything which is not necessary for the patient uh, uh, pathology. So I thought uh, this would be the correct uh, platform to uh, ask MS uh, to talk to, to us about the uh, external eye disease, uh, what is not known, that's a uh, thing. Because even surgery or clinic, you know, he complicated cases we will make it very, very, very simple. So it's a very simple and a very, very simple the technique, a simple way, that's what we learned from him for the last uh, so many years. And of course, TNOA is, uh, is uh, for the past uh, so many years doing wonderful work in the field of academics. And uh, of course, we are also doing so many uh, webinars and other uh, things through the month with the national as well as the international faculty. And uh, our yeah, is also a very active academic uh, we have, after the COVID, we have extended our uh, academic activities to the periphery also, like Vellu uh, or uh, Sedambaram or Pandicherry. And also, day after tomorrow, we are having a meeting in Euro so involving the ophthalmologists of Euro and also the adjoining places. And that way, team is doing, uh, I think, it's a wonderful work. And uh, I'm happy, and uh, we are having a wonderful team of. Uh, of its vendors and uh, management members like our secretary, Mr. Secretary Rangobar, and uh, Atik, our uh, uh, ISC chairman, and uh, Dr. Neville, like the president, like the Anmuri Verman. So many people are very much uh, involved in the uh, academic activities of the Tamil after this association. I'm really very happy and I uh, feel that uh, this topic of uh, today will be a uh, uh, will be very, very useful for all of the uh, practicing ophthalmologists and also postgraduates to, for their, uh, uh, to update their knowledge in their day-to-day -day practice. And to these three words, I, I ask our uh, secretary, uh, Dr. Sidran Gopal, to say a few words, and then uh, Dr. Atik, and finally, Dr. Raniza will talk to the session. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear president. Uh, it's actually a pleasant honor and uh, I would say very pleasurable experience to uh, listen to one of my earliest mentors in ophthalmology, Dr. Srinivasan, sir. Uh, I would uh, just give one anecdote from my PG days. So there was one patient who kept coming to the clinic repeatedly for corneal ulcer and finally had to be seen by sir. 
So he took up that patient. I don't know. I mean, Revati Madam will remember. I don't know how else knows that. So I used to have that old 10x microscope which we used to do the scraping on a couch. So sir scraped that patient and said, just made one remark. He said, this doesn't feel like a fungal ulcer. So that is the first time I realized actually when you scrape an ulcer, only later on you put it in a microscope and look at everything. You know how it feels, how a fungal ulcer feels and how a bacterial ulcer feels. I don't I don't ever think anybody else can have that much experience in these sort of things. Sir looks at all the finer nuances, which probably lesser models like us can't even think of. So I'm sure this talk will be really enriching for everybody across generations. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, sir, for arranging this wonderful uh, event. Uh, over to you, Atik. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Ramakrishnan, sir, for uh, 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 giving us the opportunity to uh, listen to a legendary MS, sir. Today, I don't have the privilege of introducing uh, MS, sir. It has been taken over from me by Anita, madam, and uh, Christy, madam. So, uh, I envy both of you. Uh, so, to begin with, we have uh, uh, a very dynamic uh, person, uh, Dr. Christy, as our uh, moderator for today. Uh, she heads the Department of Cornea and Refractive Services at uh, Arvind Eye Hospital. And uh, she's a very active uh, person in the Pondicherry Ophthalmic Association. She's the current secretary. Uh, she had a vital role in organizing our ARC meeting in uh, Pondicherry. It was a pleasurable experience. A very academically oriented person. She has done over 35 uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications in national and uh, international journals. Uh, the other... <coughs> A moderator we have with us is uh, the dynamic uh, head of department of cornea and refractive services, uh, Dr. Anita Venugopal, madam. Uh, she has special interest in ocular surface procedures with uh, Gortex, uh, keratoporcesis, and in keratoconus. Uh, she has more than 64 publications in uh, national and international peer reviewed uh, journals. Uh, thank you so much, madam, for having organized this uh, webinar for us and for having accepted to uh, moderate it. I request you to kindly take over. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. I'm able to see my slides? Yes, madam. Yes, yes, Anita. Yes. Good evening to one and all. Myself, Dr. Anita, bid a warm welcome to all of you for this master class webinar on external eye diseases and its management. What is not known? It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. our honorable speaker, Dr. M. M. Srinivasan, sir, who is the man of distinct vision and fountainhead of eliminating ideas, an idol of knowledge and experience and inspiration to all of us. Sir is one of the founding members of uh, Aravind IK system. He has joined Aravind IK system in 1981. He is the Director Emeritus of Aravind Eye Care System and the Director of Aravind Integrated Eye Bank Services. He is a lifetime member of All India Ophthalmological Society, Tamil Nadu Ophthalmological Society and National Society for Prevention of Blindness and Eye Bank Association of India. He has been listed among the top 2% scientists of the world by Stanford University in 2020. Sir has many awards and orations. The list is never ending. Moreover, he is the best teacher. He would show us where to look, what to see, and finally, what not to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our invite and agree to share your expertise. On behalf of TNOA and Aravind IK system, we welcome you, sir, for this one bit webinar on MasterCard speech. We have, we have with us in the panel, Three stalwarts who have done phenomenal work in the field of cornea. Dr. Srinivas K. Rao, sir. He is the director of Darshan IK at Chennai. Sir was the best outgoing student in Madras Medical College and he has achieved gold medal for the best performance in FRCS Edinburgh in 2002. Moreover, he is a very busy practitioner and many of my relatives in Chennai have got operated by him for cataract. And he has more than 30 years of experience in the management of complex corneal and ocular surface disorders. We welcome you, sir, for the webinar. We are looking forward to hear from you, sir. Thank you. 
So uh, this is Dr. Christie. So I would like to introduce the next two panelists on board, our very own Dr. Radhika Natarajan, uh, uh, who's a Deputy Director of CJ Shar Cornea Services at Shankar Netralia Chennai. So she is a Madras Medical College alumni, and she completed her ophthalmic education from Shankar Netralia and uh, innumerable awards to her uh, uh, name. And uh, to name a few are uh, even during her surgery and pharmacology uh, UG days, so she's got a lot of awards and uh, she's excellent uh, experience in coronary infection surface disorders. Uh, and so it will be so nice to hear from uh, Dr. Radhika Ma'am. And uh, she has close to 40 publications uh, and 232 citations in most of the national and international peer review journals. And the next panelist on board uh, is uh, Dr. Revati Raja Raman, uh, uh, who's uh, the head of the Department of Cornea and Refractive Services in Arvind Eye Hospital, Coimbatore. So she completed her uh, medical education from Tanjavur Medical College and MS from Stanley Medical College, Chennai. So she did her fellowship in Cornea at Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai, and uh, was a one of the first students of uh, Dr. M. Srinivasan, sir. And she's taken part in uh, many clinical trials like SCUT uh, in month one and two. And she's close to 50 publications in national and international peer review journals. So with these stellar panelists on board, I'm sure today is going to be uh, uh, definitely a worthy, uh, uh, memorable uh, masterclass for us to hear from the legend himself, Dr. M. Srinivasan, sir. And I welcome you all once again for this uh, amazing masterclass lecture. Uh, over to MS, sir, to start the lecture, please. Uh, Christy, you are now. What is the duration of the talk? Yeah, you can talk for. <laughs> no, no, no. Discussion, discussion, how much time you need, you know? Half an hour, half an hour. Okay. Yes. Okay. 50 minutes, you can talk. I would like to appreciate and thank uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, uh, President of TNOA, uh, Dr. Nirmal Frederick, uh, President-elect, and uh, Arun Muli Varman, Vice President, and uh, Chairman uh, ARC, and uh, Secretary Kobal, and all other uh, members of TNOA, especially scientific committee members, for giving me this uh, I will say it is not opportunity. All of you made me to read at least for two or three days and uh, to refresh my um, uh, memories and also pull some slides. So here, uh, Dr. Ramagrishan asked me to external ITCs and management. What is not uh, known to the audience is also unknown to me. So um, some of the diseases I'm going to talk is very basic. So some of you may be surprised why I am talking about this, such a known disease like that. But um, there are a lot of practical implications. It's not the management. There are a lot of the practical implications of some of the diseases I'm going to show you. So like conjunctivitis, you know, it's a first um, adenoviral conjunctivitis that diagnosed in RIO in, in, uh, in early 1900 by British ophthalmologists. So it is called metasai from there. So now, even today, after 100 years, everyone call any pink eye, red eye, they call still metasai. Uh, it is more common um, in uh, childhood and adulthood. See, 6 million people in the US, they get conjunctivitis every year. And um, the loss of work is so enormous. So, and if you think about, um, U.S. population is one-fourth of Indian population. Then uh, for India, I don't know how many million conjunctivitis you will get. This 42 to 80 percent bacterial and 70 uh, percent viral could be true. I don't know. But for me, is somehow it has the, the flora has changed. Instead of bacterial and viral, we are getting uh, the different one now. So what I see in clinic almost every day at least one case of conjunctivitis treated by uh, at least two or three ophthalmologists before uh, getting into my chamber. And already they have used a lot of powerful antibiotics just like uh, Vigamax, 
um, <coughs> are lubricants, steroids. So now every conjunctivity patient, uh, they end up buying antibiotics, lubricants, steroids, uh, cymoxid, all those powerful antibiotics about 600 to 700 rupees. And then they go to next ophthalmologist and uh, he doesn't know what to do because already he has all the medicines and he prescribes something else. Then uh, when they come to us, see this clinical picture, this is severe case, but early cases, conjunctivitis mostly bilateral, adults or young adults, sometimes old people also. And uh, this kind of superficial punctured cut of the taking of stain, if you see the morphology, it is not uniform. It has different size. If you look at uh, conjunctivitis due to adenovirus, again bilateral, you will have SPK, but it usually started as uniformly. It won't be like this. So coarse. And um, see the different size. So they call it a stacan appearance, so it's literally elevated. A white is a gray lesion and easily comes up when you wipe it with a cotton spud, serial cotton spud. So it mimics the viral conjunctivitis. These patients, they come after maybe a week or 10 days with uh, severe lid edema, chemosis. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. Land phone, I think. I'm sorry, it's also landline there. So, and uh, since three, four years. It was common during the initiation, but now throughout the year you are getting, you get severe lid edema, chemosis, and uh, membrane, periodic node enlargement, submandibular node enlargement. Some cases I have seen parotid node also. So these cases, after healing, they end up like adenovirus, subepithelial catopathy, and uh, once the lesion is healed, the specific medicine I'll tell you later. And this is a big concern for both patient and the doctor. This will not disappear in, uh, in a month or two months. It takes three months, six months, even one year. If it is in visual axis, that's a big issue. Photophobia, drop in vision, and uh, you use steroids, sometimes uh, cyclosporin, Advice, all those things, but it takes so much time. So if they come early, and if you treat with fluconazole 0.3%, this is a magic drug, this is antifungal. I use routinely for all the patients, four times a day for a week or 10 days, it heals nicely. If you want to confirm the diagnosis, and you just scrape the lesion, with a Johnson butt, sterile butt, and put it on a slide, ask your technician to do the gram stain, and uh, you will see nice spores. And if you have very severe uh, chemosis or something, you can take a little bit of conjunctiva and do biopsy, you will get so many things. So this you don't miss. I don't do it routinely for every case, but just to demonstrate or confirm or convince my fellows and I do this. But in spite of this, even now our own doctors, um, first they prescribe all powerful antibiotics. So steroids, they have no role. When they have such a severe conjunctivitis and watering, and what is the role of lubricants, the tear drops, all those things. I just give this, but if there is severe chemosis, lead edema, I give some oral uh, anti-inflammatory drugs for three days, and they do well. So this is very basic, but now the treatment, the etiology has changed, the management also has changed. So we should think about this instead of, because adenovirus is self-limiting, 
there is no specific drug for adenovirus. You can wait for a week, but already a patient has seen two consultants and they come to you to think about this and go for this. And uh, second one is this myomitis. So such a simple disease, easy to diagnose, but management is very tough. It, it runs bilateral. The implication is not, it's not a blinding disease. It's a chronic uh, conjunctival uh, rib, rib margin inflammation. And it's a, it's a discomfort for the patient. And there is no specific medicine except uh, hygiene, personal hygiene. But the implication is, suppose if Srinivas Rao wants to put a contact lens in this case, you cannot do that. Suppose um, Ratika wants to do some uh, PRK or LASIK, you can't take this case. And you want to do any intraocular surgery, I don't know, it will take months. So such a simple lesion, but it has a lot of implications on your practice. The etiology, you know, it could be infective, inflammatory, whatever it is, poor personal hygiene, cleaning. But this is a typical, this is a very advanced case. You can see heaps of snow like this. It's like a snowflakes. The early case you can see on temporal side. And this is a typical case of mavomitis. And uh, this case has lid edema also. And this um, I read somewhere. And uh, this is uh, metaplasia of memory glands. And this one, when I do cataract surgery, I have not seen most of the cases prior. So usually when you apply speculum, it just it pops out. Or from each artifice, you can get a lot of putty material like, like, a, like a wax. And it's mostly not infective, but nowadays most of the surgeons, even on the table, they postpone the case. They then send it. So when it will take up again, it will take months. I don't know whether it will heal or not. So usually just it is non-infective. I just clean it and uh, we apply some betadine on the table with a cotton tip and take up for the surgery. But most common infection is Cephalococcus, mostly facultative, uh, non pathogenic organisms, and um, sometimes uh, Demodex or other parasites, chlamydia, all it is, it is, I don't know really it contributes or not. It's mentioned in the textbooks metabolic problems, hormonal problems, all those things on the earth you can mention. But here, treatment is just. Uh, cleaning the lead margin, massage, heart fermentation, and um, some basic antibiotics like ascromycin. Some people give oral uh, tetracycline or, or uh, azithromycin for weeks or months, usually two weeks to four weeks. So this is a chronic problem. Patient will have uh, um, irritation, uh, itching, red dye, watering, all discomforts will be there. And um, this would explain the patient, it's not a blinding disease, but uh, it will take time. Like um, now, these are the transillumination. Now you have the fancy uh, equipments like tools uh, to do mammography. And also, I think we had a machine called Hydro. They had a demo here. It's a very fancy equipment to massage your lids. So these things, some patients, they have a big file of all these pictures, but uh, finally end up treatment is heart fermentation, massage, lid hygiene, antibiotics, mostly basic like tetracycline ointment. I don't know if you get it or not, but uh, you will have acetromycin ointment is very toxic. Then lubricants for because here the problem is the lipid layer is the problem. So these people who have evaporative uh, dry eye, then uh, you have to add lubricants. And now you have this lipid flow, thermal pulsation or massage. Uh, I think uh, once in two weeks they do it. 
Some patients, they feel better, but there's too much for me. I can't sit with a patient with such a big equipment for um, half an hour or 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes or 45 minutes talking to them. It's a simple disease, but if you have facility, you have uh, staff, you know, assistant or technician to take it, you can do it, but it's very costly equipment. But uh, my advice will be heart fermentation, uh, lead massage, lead hygiene, antibiotics, and uh, explain the patient, it will take time. Then uh, this blepharitis again, is again bilateral disease, chronic, and uh, you again, uh, poor lead hygiene, poor personal hygiene, then uh, focal infections with uh, all uh, uh, facultative uh, organisms like mostly cephalococci, uh, albus, I think. So sometimes you may get uh, not pathogenic organisms. Here again, you will have this uh, marginal keratitis, vascularization, uh, like friction, like fascicular ulcer. Then this one is funny thing is tough marginal keratitis. And if this, these patients are uh, on contact lens, daily wear, short lens or RG lenses, it will be tough to differentiate whether it is infective or uh, inflammatory or uh, immunogenic. So that's the thing. But I could not explain why it is distributed like this. You should have uh, space between the limbus and the lesion. If it is PUK or marginal cartilage PUK, you won't have the space between the lesion and the limbus. Here you will have definite space. Then you have adjoining infections, cardiolum internum, cardiolum externum, chelation, all these things will be there. But uh, again, the treatment is the problem. And see this beautiful case, how it is distributed and why, I don't know, but it's very easy to diagnose. So these are the cases I treat with topical antibiotics and the steroids. Steroids definitely work in these patients. Without steroids, they don't get all right. Then what a doxycycline you can give two weeks or four weeks, then lead hygiene and um, it will subside. So now on the market, you have all these things, lead cleaners, superoxide solution, and strios all to just clean the lids. They have limbs in this, and every day you can, you can ask them to clean. And all those, this also, everything to clean that with a, with a sterile cotton swab or uh, cotton strips. So this, see, so there's no harm advising this because they have tried everything and uh, uh, you can advise them. I used to tell them, uh, use Johnson baby shampoo and Johnson butts soak it and rub it on the lid margin and uh, at least twice a day for a few minutes and wash with warm water and uh, they may become all right. So these diseases itself is not the big issue, but uh, when these people get cataract or something else, you want to do surgery, that's a big issue for the surgeon. Surgeon is terribly scared about this to take this case. And uh, this herpetic ocular infection and it's a prevalence, you know, mostly unilateral. In atopic disease, some cases may be bilateral. So here the diagnosis is not the issue. Parents sometimes may give the history of something, insect bite, all those things. That's a typical. Here the conjunctiva is not involved, the cornea is not involved, maybe primary herpes, mostly in children or adults but sometimes it will be bilateral. So second attack, they may get epithelial herpes. And, um, and this one, I am the, I'm just interested in this case, it's easy to diagnose. But the problem is when to start oral antiviral in these cases, not at this stage. At this stage, it's all healed late. So you want to hit even before this, this is also you have pustules like vesicles. Before vesicles, these patients come with very severe unilateral headache for three days. Then they will have erythema. Then they have papules and pustules. 
At that stage, when there is erythema, if you start oral acyclovir, like uh, four grams per day for seven to 10 days, it may minimize the uh, formation of scar or lacycles and um, sometimes post hepatic neuralgia, but uh, doesn't alter the course of the disease. It will make the patient little comfortable. And when I see an adult patient having head disaster, I definitely ask uh, or order uh, to rule out HIV. So most of these patients, if you probe them, initially they will deny, then they will say, you ask them whether you have any tablets for months together, one month, six months like that in the government hospital. And then they agree, they, they come out with the truth that yes, uh, I'm taking, they may have a notebook. So anybody under 40 getting health disaster or under 30, and I will ask for the HIV test. And topically, when the vesicles like this, in the eye, uh, unless you have microdendrites, you don't need anything. Maybe you can give antibiotics. But for the forehead or the skin lesions, I order low calamine or Hepax 5% ointment, whatever uh, comfortable, so that um, you, you just keep it a little bit dry and avoid uh, pustules, getting into pus, all those things. So that is for topical application. For the eye, 3% acyclovir. For the skin, 5% uh, acyclovir ointment. Or just collect your <coughs> lotion is enough. Cannot uh, that is, many people they apply at home, they will, they will call it as uh, Ramakati. Uh, that also they apply. So here, these patients, sometimes post herpetic neuralgia, mostly patients above 60 years, they get post herpetic neuralgia. It runs for uh, years, um, very severe. Then they will have all funny sensation over the forehead and the uh, frontal area. Some people may get episcleritis, scleritis, acromotor palsy, all those things, maybe after one month, after three months, like that. That's you should explain the patient or you anticipate when they visit again. So here, this picture I show you because when to start a cyclovir orally. So initial stage, it works. After that, uh, I think you don't need that. You just eat. Um, post herpetic neuralgia with uh, IQ tryptomate 25 milligram once or twice, and some uh, um, vitamins. And if it's old patients, mostly look for immunosuppressive drugs, whether they are taking any treatment for uh, renal transplantation, uh, chemotherapy, uh, oral steroids, rheumatoid arthritis, all those things, they will have it. Most of them will have it unless you ask they may think it is not necessary to tell all those things to, her, uh, to the doctor. So when you see young patient with health disaster, you should rule out HIV, and if old patients, you rule out any systemic diseases. So this patient, interesting, I saw this guy, small boy, 25 years back. I could not diagnose this. So unilateral, very severe, lid inflammation, very severe ulcerative blepharitis, not squamous, and unilateral, and uh, bulbar conjunctiva is normal, cornea is clear, I don't know what was it. Then at that time, one resident from uh, US, and those guys, they are very good in uh, diagnosing herpes simplex. So he said, this is typical blepharitis due to herpes simplex virus, unilateral. Then I applied, uh, a cyclovir ointment within a week, he became all right. But otherwise, before that, he had several weeks of treatment with all the antibiotics, was not responding. So sometimes you may get patients like this unilateral ulcerative blepharitis due to herpes regulations. That's about herpes. Then your friend, um, VKC. So VKC, you know, it starts in childhood maybe ends in uh, late adulthood. So patient, uh, so you, if you want to avoid the patient, it's not possible. They will come every three months to you and uh, same questions, same answers, same medicines. 
you don't know what to do. So sometimes if it is very severe and the patient comes with vernal ulcer, suppose uh, the boy is going for attending, appearing for an exam or an interview or something traveling and he is uh, watering like anything, epiphora, severe epiphora, not even uh, open the eyes. So I give at this stage, they've already tried all those uh, um, drives, anti-allergic drops, mask stabilizers, topical steroids, all those things. But in these cases, this sometimes they I give supratarsal um, uh, steroid, either decatron or tricot. And the thing is, I ask all my fellows, have you given supratarsal? Yes, sir. Then you go and observe, they give here. It's not supratarsal. You inject here, everything will leak out. So because all fibrous tissue and uh, so your drug will leak out. Supratarsal means really you should go here. So when you inject, it should balloon. So that means you are in a correct position. So this one advantage is it definitely controls the inflammation and the patient uh, stays comfortable and uh, no blepharos for some photophobia, all those things watering. But maybe it will be effective for three to six months. Again, you have to repeat. The advantage is T right, this is in your control, and uh, the patient is T right responder on all those things, you can stop it. If you prescribe topical T right, you never know. So I used to tell all the parents, the disease will never make the patient blind but the drugs will make the patient blind. So I always want steroids when it's severe, I give pulse dose, not tapering dose, and some low dose steroids. But many people still they use, you know, they, they give steroids, they say magic drug, then they end up with steroid induced glaucoma or cataract, that's worse than the disease. And uh, so you can get severe forms also. Bilateral VKC, you know, this here, you know, till adulthood, they get transplants very active, and only visual axis is clear. And this guy, you know, the visual axis, everything is covered. There's no liver stem cells, nothing, completely vascularized by chemical injury. So, this patient, I just one patient I tried removing all the fibrovascular tissue and put amniotic membrane. But again, I got same picture. So I don't touch now. So this unfortunate patient, bilateral, there's no use of stem cell transplantation or amniotic membrane transplantation. And uh, so again, if symptoms are severe, I give topical steroids. And even uh, so checking intraocular pressure also so crucial. And it's, sometimes you get false reading. And sometimes I give supratarsal. So my routine is in these cases, uh, any mast cell stabilizer, then uh, steroids pulse dose for maybe a week or sometime, then I abruptly stop, I don't taper. Then now I use uh, tacrolimus, find not 3%, it's called tacrolimant or tacrios. I asked them to apply at night. Initially I was a little bit concerned whether it is toxic or something. Then I have re reports, even pediatric uh, uh, patients, they use for a year, nothing happens. I was surprised this pair of tacrios or tacrimon, even use for a year, you never get any toxicity on the cornea like, uh, like epithelial, uh, punctate epithelial defect or uh, congestion or something. So uh, my weapon is now, once I control the acute thing, then for, for long treatment, I give tacrimant ointment at night. And this vernal ulcers, again, supratarsal or steroid pulse dose, uh, mostly sometimes bilateral. Again, it comes back. And uh, some people suggest, you know, you remove the, surgically remove the papillae, they make them all right, or contact lenses. But it's nothing to do with uh, mechanical uh, trauma. It is, it's just they get, I don't know why superior, but rarely inferior. So this, again, uh, they need steroids, supratarsal, 
uh, tight remand and uh, you have to explain the question. Unfortunate, they get like this. Then atopic dermatitis, somebody is getting uh, atopic dermatitis. First time above the age of 40 or 50, um, again, BKC above the age of 40. Again, I want to rule out HIV. And these patients, the most common uh, atopic case due to atropine or neosporin. Atropine, usually you don't apply both eyes unless you now for myopia treatment, they give for uh, uh, atropine topical drops, dilute drops. Otherwise, ointment usually you apply for Ilitis, hydrocyclitis, corneal ulcer, or something mostly in one eye. But uh, both eyes you don't use atropine. But neosporin ointment, some people they use, and or penicillin ointment, or uh, post uh, pre <coughs> op in cataract surgery or in retina clinic, they direct with tropicamide. Some people they get severe allergy to this. So tropicamide, I have seen they produce like this. But uh, this patient, unfortunately, now there are so many ailments available as, um, as ocular uh, preparation. The tube is exactly like ocular preparation. And these ailments are for uh, other skin lesions and something for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, all those things. And they apply mistakenly into the eye as an eye ailment. They end up like this. Here the treatment is and look for the culprit, and then uh, I just give steroid ointment, basic ointment, to apply ophthalmic ointment. Like, uh, I don't know whether hydrocortisone you get it now. I give uh, the overflow BM, it has betamethasone, easily visible, and um, or any other uh, uh, steroid combination with antibody without neosporin. I ask them to apply over the lips, it disappears. But really, you should look for why they get it at our peak. It's very severe. And then um, this conjunctival calysis, and uh, I started uh, diagnosing for the past 10 years. Uh, so I picked up when I attended an, uh, an RO meeting, and one, uh, one doctor from, uh, from uh, Thailand, he was presenting this. Uh, otherwise, uh, I was not aware. I was totally ignorant about this. And this mostly old patients smile and um, they come. Uh, the funny thing is, most of us they miss it because we just see the cardiac people, IOL, no PCO, fine, lead margin, fine. And then you ask them to blink and see, and you will notice this. And this is a beautiful. Uh, Lymphangiectasis of the conjunctiva, and uh, uh, I don't know, cosmetically, how will you access this? I don't know. I have this patient, and I don't do anything. If he's symptomatic, I just treat. And uh, you can see the beautiful uh, calysis here. See, here, you know, pseudophagia, 6 6 vision, they come every month uh, to you. You have operated, fine. Sometimes you get upset. What is this? You know, you are 70 year old. I have given 6 6 vision and you are coming every time and uh, maybe malingering or something. Their complaint is irritation watering. So again, you give tear drops. Already they have a P4 of watering. Again, you give tear, tear drops. They never become uh, all right. So this one is treatment is if they are symptomatic, you just you can cartilage the conjunctiva at slit lamp or at OT. I used to excise that uh, redundant conjunctiva just uh, away from the limbus inferior, maybe like a crescent save. Initially, I was suturing the tendon. Now I don't suture. I just leave it with fibros and the patient uh, become asymptomatic. So these patients, uh, white eye, so mostly sort of fake patients coming to you, both is watering, irritation, all those things, you look for this. So this is congenital calysis. And this beautiful molluscum, and uh, they come with chronic conjunctivitis, uh, like plicton uh, or even uh, sclerokeratitis. The whole cornea is hazy. 
and the treatment is they can have near the lips or in their hand also. Whenever they rub to get the fatty material into the eye, it is a, it's a viral disease again. Uh, the inclusion bodies from this lesion, they get into the eye. And here the treatment is some people, uh, they just observe some once it, it, it pops out from the summit. And then uh, you can't, unless you remove it. So some of us, we learned just cauterizing with a needle with iodine factory. So I just, uh, I'm not happy about that because once you poke it, you are not removing the material and uh, you constantly using, oozing patient gets, no, they never get better. So what I do is here, the mostly children, no question of anesthesia for this. So in the OP, I just clean it with the beaded in and uh, use uh, mosquito artery forceps, curved forceps. You just fix it here in the base. And you lock the forceps, this will pop up like a popcorn. Very easy, little bit bleeding, completely it comes out, the patient becomes all right. Then you can give topical steroids for a few days and uh, that's a treatment. You have to express it. If they have molars come all over the face and uh, are uh, so adult or children, I have seen patient, mother and uh, daughters having molars come all over the face following HIV. These are the AIDS patients they have. You can't express all the molars come. Maybe Anything more severe one, large one, you can apply cryotherapy. It's not rare, still you can see that. The unfortunate thing is, these things, you know, what, what they do is, nowadays, nobody is looking at the face of the patient. They, they don't use even touch light. Immediately they put them in the fancy sweet lamp and they miss everything. They don't look at the lips, forehead, all those things. So they miss the lesion, they only look here. So you should, before putting them into slit lamp, you should please, even without touch it with the naked eye, you just look for the scar or anything, previous lesions, that will give you your clue. So this rhinospodium, more common in South India and Sri Lanka, and some rhinospodium spreads from the pond water, stagnant water, not the flowing river, and this, um, it's again uh, fungus, between fungus and uh, they called mesotomia or something. And um, transmitted from the animal. Animals, they have uh, this uh, in their uh, nostrils, nose. When they drink water in the pond, they brim and they release all the spores into the water. The kids, when they take bath in the pond water, they will get this. So. Suppose like Ganges or something, you won't get this. Mostly South India, Sri Lanka, you have this. This is the early lesion. Christian bleeding will be there. Usually it involves the lacrimal sac and nose. And they go to ENT people. So the, in my days, the teaching was, when there is rhinos for him, lacrimal sac, it was a definite contraindication for DCR. So it will bleed. So this one easy to excise, totally excise. There's no medical treatment. Here, it's very rare to involve the sclera, rhinos podia. The first publication by Dr. Lamba and Sue, when they were working at Jipmer, they identified this. And we had about uh, more than half a dozen patients. So first to visit, so this stage I can pick up. I can easily diagnose the spots and put it in the microscope. You can see the spores, but at this stage, many people they thought is hemangioma, malignant melanoma, those things. Actually, this case I put in the uh, operating microscope under GA. Then I was working here. Then I found out it was emerging from the within the within the globe. It was a choroid. What you see is a choroid. So if you cut, you will make a big hole in the retina. This patient, no symptoms except the cosmetic premise, 6-6 six, six vision. Sometimes you can see through the lids. So here you have to explain. There's nothing to excise or add anything. So this rhinos podium, you, this lesions, you just excise. It's come all right. Surgical excision is the cure. 
and uh, some people they try dapson or something and uh, i just exercise and if in this this is clinical nodule in those days and these people when we have um, hydrocyclitis or uh, it was named as conglomerate tuberculosis when my student days unfortunately all these patient <coughs> will get anti tuberculosis shift and streptomycin inh for 3 months now recently i think uh, few years back our uh, dr ratram she did the study and this actually it's a parasite inside and again uh, kids mainly pudukote districts they take uh, bath in the ponds this is a parasite larvae from um, snail so this is snail the pigeons they take snails and they drop in the pond and uh, and they get this not only single nodule many nodules even over the lids beautiful and here the treatment is you just exercise and prove it and again prevention you tell the patient kids not to take bath in the ponds so this is a series of patients we proved it is it's a nematode and this one is not nematode is again is a plasmacytosis why she got it is a 30 year old female again only surgical excision and biopsy proved that and otherwise is not a malignant lesion and this again tenant granuloma uh, following in you know, a buckling sutures is a, is a, again poro supramed sutures usually for encircling band sometimes we will get this unless you remove this it is not going to heal it tenant granuloma was more common after terigem surgery and uh, if it is small one you treat with steroids a big one again you have to exercise how people they cover with amniotic membrane or, or healthy conjunctiva this you should look for some of the nodules and this one very rare choristoma and say again this girl had the bilateral choristoma Initially, I was not, uh, I was totally, I was not aware what is it. Then I just started exercising here. So I dissected, it was like cartilage and it was going through the superior phonics and, and involved in the sclera. Just I stopped maximum exercise and did biopsy. It's a choristoma. These kids will have uh, the same lesion, intracranial and also sometimes they have the over the scalp uh, uh, some area of alopecia and here they will have astigmatism but uh, cosmetically is the issue but uh, you don't know what to do it's a polytoma you have to explain and uh, this one you know nimble dermoid easy to diagnose mostly parents them and they come for cosmesis when the kids are especially girls and the pubertal age group for cosmetic radiation and the most of these patients will have a segment some amblyopia because they don't come uh, before uh, seven eight years so that you can treat as amblyopia here only thing is excision under ga and don't be too aggressive and uh, go stage by stage and uh, sometimes we may perforate the cornea always keep your donor cornea for lamellar graft and tell the patient this is only cosmesis based on the lesion you may have some scar but you can't completely remove it but you can uh, reduce that uh, this all this size of the swelling hairs and all those things and this i don't know why what is this lesion i don't know why he has a dermoid mostly temporal and they may have some syndromes like golden heart and uh, here only cosmetic uh, surgery and these lesions i don't know initially i thought it was plicton but uh, was not responding to regular steroids or tetracycline, doxycycline. Then you do definitely congenital biopsy. Then most of the cases you may end up in diagnosing ocular tuberculosis. Then you have to treat as tuberculosis. And plicton, sometimes you can have it limbus and uh, like a yellowish nodule, leaves of vessels, but you can have plicton all over the vulvar conjunctiva here, like there's so many lesions. Again, plicton, uh, again, it's not infective. Initially, 
Uh, in our days, they usually they want to rule out pulmonary tuberculosis. But that's a teaching, you know, whenever you have ocular tuberculosis, the patients mostly they don't get pulmonary tuberculosis. Ocular tuberculosis is mostly focal. And this could be like, a, uh, like any other, like streptococcal, some antigens, some candida, something like that. But treatment is again steroid, topical steroids. Uh, it could be one eye or both eyes recurrent. They may end up in pescular ulcer. This is a ruptured chalation. Treatment is excision. And uh, again, uh, episcleritis. See the difference between episcleritis and this lesion. This lesion is nicely salmon pink. You can see the individual vessels. Bulbar congenital will be white, patient, uh, no tenderness, no pain. And here they come with tenderness of a week duration of three days, four days, following trauma, without trauma, recurrent. And this is severe scleritis, diffuse scleritis. So when they attend your clinic, uh, basically I rule out diabetes and look for ESR. Then um, you rule out rheumatoid arthritis. And some people, they ask for a lot of immunological tests, ANA, ANCA, so uric acid, all those things. But whatever it is, treatment is basically only steroids. Topical steroids, oral steroids, very aggressive lesions. They go for immunosuppressives, um, even including cyclosporin, very toxic drugs. So episcleritis, mostly topical, non steroidal or steroid you can give. And uh, any systemic association, you treat it. And sometimes we have seen scleritis. Either it is infective or non infective following trauma, necrotizing scleritis. Always I want to rule out uh, nocardia. So this pus or something, or if there is an abscess, you just uh, nick it and uh, subject for uh, gram stain or acid for stain, you will get nocardia. And the treatment is different here. For nocardia, you have to give oral ampicillin or sulfa and topical uh, sulfacetamide or amicacin in response. And some patients, you may see like this, it's a scleritis all over 360 degree, little bit uh, fast hydrocyclitis. So you get following trauma, following surgery, especially cataract surgery, and are healed um, necrotizing scleritis. Could be autoimmune disease or something. It um, it migrates, it starts in one quadrant and ends up in 360 degree, maybe 12 months, 18 months, very painful. And you treat again topical steroids, oral immunosuppressives. And if it is not infective, you use all immunosuppressives. If infective, you treat as infective hepatitis. And these some of the granulomas, um, these are uh, very severe uh, PKC. Um, this, following, you know, Steven Johnson, Steven Johnson syndrome. And this one, again, you know, I, some people, they excise, they, they do mucous membrane graft or amniotic membrane graft. And so I think Sangha Nathrala, they routinely, they do mucous membrane graft, amniotic membrane graft. So patient, become, uh, patient becomes asymptomatic, but I have not tried. So this is chronic lesions, and if you have, uh, Experience in managing surgically, you can you can uh, take up these cases, but uh, every ophthalmic surgeon cannot deal with these patients. So this uh, this again you get this, then uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So this patient is a young lady, bilateral. So when an adult patient getting ocular surface neoplasia, small or big. Uh, mostly there will be HIV patients. There will be a treatment for HIV, and uh, we routinely ask for HIV. Uh, we don't hesitate, you know. Earlier days, it was a little bit uh, embarrassing to ask for the test. Now we just, we just say a blood test, and uh, and sometimes they even come out with their history. After, uh, suppose, second visit, they will tell you. So these things, Large lesion, again, surgical excision, biopsy proven, then post up, and if it is a recurrence, use, they use mitomycin, alpha, uh, 
interferon alpha, all those things. But when you see this case is a bilateral, and uh, this patient was on treatment for HIV, and this will be like pterygium, it will look like pterygium or um, cystic pterygium, or they will call it inflammatory pterygium, pingicola, all those things. So these lesions definitely gives you a clue that it could be uh, YSSN. So I do mostly, I excise through biopsy and mostly small lesions, they don't record, large lesions they may record on deal. But most of other people, especially in Western countries, they do non-surgical treatment. They try interferon alpha to be topical, um, one million per uh, uh, one million units per ml. They apply uh, four times a day uh, for um, three weeks, four weeks. Then they continue. Um, see, it runs for months, four months, three months, twelve months. I don't know. Indian patients will wait for. They will uh, ship their doctor. They will move to some other doctor because months together you are giving this. And you know this one month uh, cost of this interferon alpha is available, but uh, it is uh, $180 for a month. Then 5 fluorouracil also one can try 1% is cheaper. And mitomycin, we usually use it for uh, recurrence of uh, uh, YSSN, particularly in, in uh, um, OSSN involved in the cardia, supervised lesions, lesions. Then you use it. You can use 0.2%, not two or not four. Some people they use uh, highly weak solution, not 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 two percent. So they use four times a day for uh, one week. Then they give free, uh, treatment free duration of three weeks. Then uh, every month, one cycle, they use three months, four months. Uh, they claim uh, better results, but I have not uh, seen, uh, I have maybe only for recurrence. And finally, radiotherapy, it has its own complication. Then if you see this, I just picked up. All of you, please read uh, this month, uh, uh, Journal I, Volume 37, I think so. So very nice, two articles about one about lymphoma, other thing about YSSN. So such a big lesion, they do HR OCT, high resolution OCT. Um, so if sclera is not involved, they use topical medicines. And uh, see the lesion with the mitomycin, it has, it has healed, but I don't know. So you can, you can try, it's published recently. Then um, this is my favorite slide. These patients will have uh, pink lesions, bilateral, no pain. Only thing is redness, irritation, cosmetic issue. They go to several doctors, several years. And uh, finally, I picked up, it is nice salmon pink appearance, nice vessels, no inflammation, vision is fine. Then you prove by biopsy it is lymphoma, ocular lymphoma. Ocular lymphoma is not so common. It is one in uh, two in one million uh, patients. Are, uh, sometimes if they have uh, hard skins, um, they may have two to four percent. But this recently, maybe maybe one case every month I get. This kind of patient they have gone to several doctors throughout India. So they usually diagnose as pingicula, inflammatory pterygium, episcleritis, they get transheroidal steroids, then it never subsides. It's always central parvoid diarrhea. You have to differentiate uh, between amyloidosis, but you can see nicely like in ordinary things and see this. And this patient, what is the implication? This patient for six months, he was attending our hospital for cataract surgery. So the cataract surgeon denies surgery because it is red, inflamed, go to cardiac person. The cardiac person you just again give some uh, lubricants and uh, decongestants again, it doesn't disappear. Then I told them it's just lymphoma. You are going to make a temporal section for cataract surgery. Do it, then nothing will happen. So these patients, our duty is like this, so many people. So 
In India, I see mostly they like initial cases, but in the US and uh, UK, they see mostly like these patients and uh, they rule out. So our duty is once you diagnose this, you tell the patient, um, you have an abdominal ultrasound to rule out Hodgkin's disease. This is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Sometimes they may have abdominal uh, nodules or something. Uh, suppose you miss that and they may blame you. So you just pass a message that better you have an abdominal ultrasound, look for the glands in the neck and all those things. They even do the PET scan and here they identify the left superior phonics, that's a lymphoma here. So this lymphoma was treated by mitomycin, it is uh, no, mitomycin, it is responded. You can use interferon alpha or mitomycin, but I have not used for this. Please read the article and uh, they give very nice evidence. So ocular adnexal lymphoma, surgical excision, non-surgical, you can use all these things. Very severe cases, rituximab, 1.5 ml, you can give IV or uh, intralation, four weekly injection. Again, this one, four to six weeks, but it runs for months. And finally, EBRT. So these cases, you will get it. Then malignant irritations, repeated calcium, ribomian carcinoma. This could be early vessel cell carcinoma. This is, uh, again, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. It's not my patients. Uh, I just borrowed from other people. And these things, again, such a benign lesion. Again, you know, you people are uh, so scared about taking up for any surgery in these cases. This is just uh, uh, inflammation of the gland of mole and size, uh, all those things, central asthma. So this is not a vision threatening problem. It's not going to give you any problem when you do any intraocular surgery, but just look for this and uh, confirm the diagnosis and don't poke it. We just leave it with us. And, uh, Again, uh, this uh, ocular adnexal inflammation, I'm not going to talk about uh, diagnosis. When you have this a patient coming with such a big swelling, painful, and this is a typical case of, we call acute exercise patient of chronic diagnosis. And here treatment is oral antibiotics. And once it subsides, after a few months, you do TCT or DCR. And this is nice dermite. This would differentiate between dermite and preceptal cellulitis. Preceptal cellulitis, globe will be intact and the visual axis, everything will be clear. People will be normal. Only thing is upper lip will be involved. It could be following trauma or uh, from the sinuses. Here you give intramuscular or intravenous antibiotics for a few days, they will become all right. Only thing is you have to rule out between this and this and this. This is nice vacuole abscess. Mostly you get pneumococci, you give antibiotics. This very interesting case. So it's whole upper lid is gangrenous. So you may think it is malignancy or retinoblastoma, this and that. But you look for this and ask the history. This is mostly injury with a mark. When the children, you know, they sleep in the cradle especially tiled roof or thatched roof, the moth falls over the lids or then they rub it. All the body fluid of the moth enters this into, not into the eye, mostly over the lids. It is such a severe toxic gangrene. Even now we see, and here just topical antibiotics and uh, they become all right. But anyhow, you have to examine them anterior segment, very difficult, and uh, with lead retractor, you can, you can try. But um, this, see, there is no adjacent inflammation. This, you should uh, look for this. Mostly it's due to insect mark. And uh, look for what? Any black mass, like uh, it's not the nevus, bulbar congenital, you have any, anybody having like this, phonics, Tarsal conjunctiva, and you are a 25 year old man. So, this is definitely a malignant melanoma. So, 
to confirm you need biopsy, but biopsy, again, it will spread needle biopsy. But uh, you have to ask, the, tell the patient and the parents to look for, rule out systemic, especially liver. And this patient, they did all those scans and all those things. He had the secondaries. He died in 18 months. So if you get this patient, not very often, if you get your duty is to pass the message. Don't confirm it. Just pass the message. I have a doubt. Please go for the oncologist and our gastroenterologist, rule out all the liver problems, then you advise. And this is my last slide. So these patients, they don't come for the pain or anything. And these patients are sometimes referred. If they have cataract and they think it is a healed scleritis. Uh, so they are concerned about how to put a section in these patients. So even this year, I had two patient siblings. It is inherited disease, autosomal recessive disorder. So defect is homogenistic oxidase. It's not active, it's inactive. So you get accumulation of this acid, mostly over the tendons, medial and lateral recti incision. Other recti also will be involved. And the pinna, all the cartilages, nose, cardiac valves, and the renal, all the tendons will be involved here. It's not present threatening. Only thing is you can tell the patient you have this. So easy test is expose the urine to sunlight. You will get the urine will turn black. That there is no treatment for this. It's an inherited problem. If they come, you need not uh, worry about this. It's not going to involve the cornea or anything. Not the inside the retina or the, uh, choroid. So you just confirm and uh, no biopsy. Uh, some biochemical uh, tests, it will confirm the disease or treatment. It's just, you may not see very often, but we see when they refer for some other surgery, we see that. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I could not cover everything, but just some basic things you should have an idea. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much sir, for such an uh, enlightening talk with the beautiful clinical pic uh, images and uh, like it is like uh, looking like a dictionary sir, of uh, clinical images with the excellent insights on the practical tips in the diagnosis and management of uh, what we think as a simple uh, disorders, but it is uh, uh, has so much of clinical importance in, uh, when we are combining with cataract procedures or any other ocular or uh, any other intraocular procedures. Thank you so much, sir. And um, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask some questions to the panelists. Um, sir was mentioning about uh, snowflakes in uh, mebomitis. So uh, MGD is uh, a chronic disorder, and uh, it usually it might be associated with uh, inflammatory dry eyes. Sir, uh, uh, question to SK Rao, sir. Uh, so, whether do you prefer taking some precautions uh, before doing a cataract surgery in cases of uh, uh, MGD, or uh, do you evaluate uh, for dry eyes before uh, cataract surgery? So routine as a routine thing. Firstly, I uh, just wanted to say it's great to see MS sir again after a very long time. I remember we used to attend those contact lens meetings at LV Prasad. I think it's more than twenty-five years ago used to be a three-day meeting. So we used to have two evenings together in the LV Prasad third floor where we used to sit in the evening after dinner and have very long chats. So I I always remember, and my son Sanjeev is also from your Arvind I care system. So he is a great fan of MSR as well. Um, so it's about the earthy wisdom. I think that's the most important thing because today, like you said, we have all these toys and we take a small problem and we just blow it up and just keep on increasing the cost and complexity of what sometimes is an essentially a simple problem. And I've never forgotten his basic advice to stick to the basics. So very nice to see you again, sir. And thank you, Dr. Ramakrishnan, sir. And uh, <laughs> I think for having me here on this platform today, thank you very much for that. So basically, to get back to your question, so if uh, if I see evidence of gross mebomitis, then I will put them through about a two-week course of treatment. I don't think it cures the problem, like Sir said, 
But because cataract is not an emergency, and if I'm not seeing him on the table posted with me, and I'm seeing him as a pre-op, then I will try and get the massage done, a little bit of lit uh, ointment at night, just to get it down. No lippy flow and things like that, just hot fermentation, massage and ointment and take care of it. Dry eye in the context of cataract uh, surgery, most of the 70-year-olds we treat for cataract will have some element of dry eye, but I don't prescribe a tear substitute routinely after cataract surgery. I mean, we're creating very small incisions in the cornea, so it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, difficult to believe that those two millimeter incisions that we create in the peripheral cornea will induce dry eye. It's usually a com combination of the block if you're using it, the exposure during surgery, the surgical manipulations and the, ex the surface that is hurt and the drops that we use afterwards. Anyway, you're using drops six times a day after surgery. So I don't see the need to add another teardrop on top of that. And do I look for dry eye in every single patient I do cataract surgery for? Definitely not. I mean, clinically, when you're seeing the patient, I mean, I'm sure most of us are able to judge when there is a significant element to the tear deficit. And in those patients like a rheumatoid arthritis presenting for cataract and so on, then definitely we assess. But not for every simple cataract that we see, and I don't think we should waste time doing. Ma'am, uh, Radhika, ma'am, what are your thoughts now? Yeah, again, at the uh, cost of incurring more time and uh, being uh, repetitive, that was a mind-blowing uh, lecture, uh, Professor Srinivasan. Uh, everything was there that we know, but still there was a lot that, you know, we could uh, hear. And it was so simple, so straightforward, yet, you know, uh, so powerful. And I was really carried away by, you know, how much of common sense and basic knowledge there is in it and how very little investigation there was. There's only one thing I can say, sir, I missed being here to it. So uh, to answer your question, thanks, Anita and uh, TNOA for having me here. Thanks, uh, Atik and Professor Ramakrishnan. Uh, to answer your question, uh, yes, uh, frothing hypomitis, uh, if you see, then uh, that uh, invites two things. It causes more of tear breakup and there is an inflammatory component in the tear. So these are two things I would like to address before the patient goes in for surgery. And I also am a believer in, uh, you know, uh, lid scrub and fermentation first before uh, using any of the other uh, fancy techniques. And dry eye, unless there is an indication for uh, uh, aqueous dry eye in terms of the clinical examination, I wouldn't go about uh, investigating all these patients. But that said, you know, uh, uh, contradictorily, I also do see a lot of cataract patients being referred after the surgery to the cornea clinic. So what is very surprising is that we had large ECC incisions, we had penetrating keratoplasty, which cut all of the cornea, but dry was not common at that time. But now with more sophisticated incisions and more sophisticated uh, methods, increasingly patients uh, are having an OSDI uh, problem. Uh, you know, there is something amiss over here, probably a combination of factors, including medication and, you know, block and everything. So Equus dry is something that I won't go looking for unless I see an indication. Ma'am, if I may jut in, I know a retina person is coming into a cornea conversation, but still, uh, just a thought so, to both MS sir, you and the whole panel actually, and SK sir, how much has this new found NSAID use in cataract surgery got to do with this dry? Because as you said, in ECC days, we hardly used NSAID, but now it's becoming a part and parcel of post-cataract medication. And in my opinion, NSAID is the most... Uh, abused drug outside the eye and anti vegf is the most abused drug inside the eye. So how much of NSAID use is contributing to this post-cataract dry eye? Man? Dr. Mm. Shiram, I'm putting the question back at you. How much of NSAID do you see reducing the post-op uh, macular edema, which is supposed to, uh, the CME reduction, which is the purpose it's supposed to serve? Do you think it's really indicated in a normal cataract surgery? If the answer is no, then, uh, you know, I am not a fan of uh, nepofenac and such uh, following uh, routine cataract surgery. Probably Dr. SKR can add to that. Do you really yeah, feel yeah, that? I, I, it's, uh, I agree with that, ma'am. But what yeah. I'm asking is, how much is it? contributing to the increase in dry eye, which we are seeing now. Like you said, you mentioned ACC days, you didn't see this much dry eye, but now with smaller incision and more advanced like technology, you're seeing more dry eye. So, and we are using NSAIDs left, right, and center. So it is a definitely known fact that NSAID use uh, potentiates uh, uh, poor ocular surface uh, resurfacing. So the ocular surface is a complex structure which includes the tears, the re-epithelization, the blink, everything. The blink obviously will not be affected by the medication. But we do know that long-term NSAID is not good for the eye. I've even seen patients who come with corneal perforation after long-standing use of NSAID. 
but the exact relation of the symptoms and signs of a dry eye to NSAID, uh, you know, I have not actually researched that in my practice principally because I'm not a big fan of NSAID in the first place as a treatment, unless the patient is having anecdotal episcleritis or something like that. Yeah, your question is very pertinent. Like, uh, even I too feel uh, as an ocular surface uh, uh, person, like, no, NSAIDs, I really don't like at all for any reason. Even they were promoted for allergy and other things. So, routine use of NSAID in post cataract surgery, it's really we have to revisit and question this uh, thing. Sir, in, in, uh, Sir? in our hospital, when you do hundreds of cataracts, no, the surgeon doesn't see the patient post op. So all the, we had several patients with severe dry eye. I write the note, post up, minimum steroids, don't use NSAIDs. But it is like a machine. They just print and give. And the patient, you know, discharge is 6-6. Six, six. And they, within six days, they come with such a fine melt. You can't do anything. Can you do graft or something like that? So there are beautiful articles. There is no difference when you use NSAIDs or not. It's already you are using steroids. So then why do you want to use it? There is no proof that NSAID CME is more in um, after cataract surgery. See, suppose you have PC rent, cataract drops, inflamed eye, very bad diabetic guys already have diabetes retinopathy. These things you give. So unfortunate, every day, in my hospital, 150 patients go with bromfenac or nephafenac. And I could not convince these anti-segment cataract surgeons. It's unfortunate. So you, you choose the patient, not everyone. Same thing, uh, cobalt, blepharitis, you know, blepharitis, myomitis. How will you give intravitreal? You people are living on intravitreal now. You, know, you become medical retina, not surgical retina. So how will we give? Sir, I am still surgical retina, sir. Huh? Okay. So they send all the cases. My red eye, intravitreal, <coughs> cardiac opinion. Cardiac is clear. Okay. So like that, sometimes I don't know why we blind you. You, you are the surgeon, you know, you, you, are, you have your own patient. You just uh, don't follow all the, uh, you attend a conference and that guy said something, you just follow that. So whichever works in your hands, like you know, your father, what was he using for cataract post op? Like that, you know, you said that. In a sense, it's a dangerous drug. Agreed, sir. Truly agree. That's why I said probably outside the eye, that's the most abused drug, sir, in ophthalmology. Sir, I think at this point of time, I should share a case. Uh, it's many years uh, before, like when I was I started with my cornea uh, uh, work. So I sent you for opinion, a uh, five month uh, 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 infant. So actually the baby, uh, the mother uh, uh, brought the uh, uh, infant with, um, uh, with left eye corneal ulcer. So uh, I scraped and then uh, we, uh, and uh, it was a bacterial ulcer and then uh, patient was completely all right within one week. Then uh, one month later, again, she presented with the right eye corneal ulcer. Then I thought it was something unusual. So I wanted to get your opinion. I sent the mother and child to your clinic, sir. And um, uh, next, like, uh, the mother has gone there. I called her and verified whether she reached the hospital or not. And then within uh, one or so, I got a call from you saying that it is congenital corneal anesthesia. So what you said was the baby is uh, not crying. It is so happy. She, uh, the, uh, she was uh, uh, having uh, the face was uh, so uh, it, uh, it, it was not a, a, a sad child, like with a pain or something. So that was the uh, thing you said first to me. So I remember that uh, this like uh, even now, I even I, if I see a child with uh, pediatric children with a uh, beat the nose and the mandibular hypoplasia, typical of uh, an congenital corneal anesthesia. That and, and diagnosing that uh, the disorder at five month in a five month uh, baby is so difficult actually. And um, that clinical picture is uh, uh, it is it was a clinching thing which we sh everyone should note that. Um, yesterday I had a patient. See any 
child, you know, eight year old, 10 year old, opening widely both eyes. In yeah. five, five millimeter canyon also. Yeah. No photophobia, no peripheral spasm. You know, they are fine. You throw the torch, they look at the torch. Yeah. It's a clue, either to headpiece or congenital canyon analysis. It could be unilateral or bilateral. So, so no patient with carnal lesion will open the eyes with the touch light. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, I have an, uh, a few uh, patients are there. I can say handful of patients uh, with a recurrent unilateral blepharokeratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis in a teenage. Sir, uh, like I want to uh, ask uh, the panels like whether uh, you have seen like, uh, such a uh, case like in your clinics also and what are your thoughts about this uh, a recurrent blepharokeratoconjunctivitis it responds to st uh, topical steroids and uh, again and again the patient comes only in that time and corneal lesions uh, panels everything uh, uh, typical presentation of uh, so devati ma'am um not that I am seeing often uniocular, but whenever we see even sometimes binocular, uh, one more thing I want to rule out is Demodex. Uh, you look for it many times, you will, you will be surprised. Still, I don't know whether that is the cause, but uh, definitely that could be an aggravating factor or the reason why they are not responding to the usual other um, things. And it's not... Uh, very unusual to get uh, maybe me and dysfunction even in children. You can see even in children with uh, blocked maybe glands and also that is also a possibility. And also think about acne rosacea, especially in the ocular, keep uh, acne rosacea in mind. Um, uh, like uh, in demod, if you are suspecting demodex, uh, like uh, what is what is your management line of management? Yeah, that um, original textbook uh, advises are about um, tea, tea oil and all. Mm. But what we use here is neem oil. Yes. So and now they have that um, one wipe is there with the tea tree oil, a little expensive. Echo. So what we go for it, um, go for is um, neem oil. We ask them to take neem oil as well as um, coconut oil, laugh off, mix it. Uh, to apply like as we take our oil bath, you know, a weekly oil bath, like that to apply it over the face. It's not only for the lid margin because these um, mites will be there in all the hair follicle all over the body. So to use it uh, from uh, forehead to neck, apply for wait for half an hour and then wash it. This is what we advise when many uh, patients who are use, doing it uh, very meticulously, they, we see really great improvement in their symptoms and signs. And another thing, if uh, they are men, I used to suggest, um, you know, to re reduce their facial hair. Many of them you can see with beard and all. So I used to tell them, if possible, try to reduce your um, facial hair. Uh, but some of them really, they do well with all this advice. Christy, you want to... Yeah, good evening. So uh, other than that, I also wanted to ask... Uh, our expert uh, panelist opinion on how do they manage a case of blepharitis? What is the role of doxycycline? How long do, do you give them? And what are the other common instructions that you advise for a patient with blepharitis? Yes, uh, Classically for blepharitis, I don't use doxycycline because that is more for me for mebomian dysfunction, which is there. So oftentimes it's Belopharitis and mebomian dysfunction will be combined. So if I see a significant component of mebomian dysfunction, then I will use doxycycline. I normally use it 100 milligrams once a day for about 10 days as the course at the start, if the mebomian dysfunction is significant enough. But for blepharitis per se, it's just lid scrubs and antibiotic ointment. And if there's a lot of inflammation on the lid margin, then the antibiotic ointment will also contain a steroid. But like Sir said, I try and avoid giving them that because the contact time is longer, the risk of uh, steroid response is higher. So I will use it if needed and try and use it for a very short period of time. Um, just going back to the earlier question, if you have a unilateral, very severe thing, oftentimes you look at the other eye right? because quite often mebomian dysfunction and its related ocular surface changes can be very asymmetric. 
So I've had patients who have a very bad one eye and the other eye, if you look very carefully, you'll see subtle signs. But if you're absolutely convinced it's only unilateral, something else that you can consider is adult uh, chlamydial disease. Uh, quite often in young sexually active adults, it'll be the right eye. So then you can explore that possibility. It's very difficult to look for the chlamydia because uh, you scrape and you have to do immunofluorescence and all that is not possible. But if you have a history and you have a strong suspicion, if you give azithromycin for three days, that usually fixes it. And then you can continue with the rest of your treatments. So if you have the suspicion, three days of azithromycin followed by a week of doxy for these patients will help. And for tea tree oil, a reasonably cost-effective uh, option is the Himalaya herbal shampoo. That contains 5% tea tree oil. So wow. our patients, basically my patients, they wash their face, just clean the face with a towel, leave the moisture around the eyelids, take a drop of the shampoo, and then they massage the base of the lashes for about five minutes at night before going to sleep. And this usually works. And like Madam said, they use some kind of a tea tree oil containing soap for their face during their bath. So these two things can also help. Um, if time permits, I would like to share one, one of my case. I mean, what I learned from MSR, a child presented with a punched out corneal uh, ulcer, um, very, very much thinning, punched out, and usually supranasal or supra temporal. A few cases uh, we have seen, and immediately sir will say, you were to double evert and see, look for. So you will see the bindi sitting there. And uh, uh, the, some of the mothers, you know, even for children, they put this um, sticking things. And the glue in the bindi is very toxic and can, can cause, because it will go and stick there for a long time and it will cause um, uh, corneal melt. So I, I, after, I mean, learning that, sometimes I have seen and I have diagnosed and uh, you swipe the thing in the, the superior phonics, you, you can take it out. Uh, unless you take it out, it can go for even perforation because it's really, it melts the cardia, the glue. Dr. Anita, to add to what uh, discussion has already happened on the unilateral uh, BKC, I think it was there somewhere hiding in uh, Professor Srinivasan's uh, presentation also. Uh, agreed that you can have asymmetric mybomitis because quite often in this, uh, you know, young uh, post pubertal age group, uh, you can have, you know, dandruff, you can have acne and you have mybomitis, which can be asymmetrical leading to this problem. But uh, occasionally you can have blepharocarditis is unilateral in a very suffused eye. So you, however the eye is congested in a BKC, you will not have, uh, you know, watery discharge and, uh, you know, sticking and all that. So that is one sign remotely that we can pick up which may indicate uh, HSV blepharocarditis conjunctivitis. It was there in Professor's pre presentation in between. Rare as it may be, it affects uh, children and young adults. And if we don't pick it up, the problem is if we use steroid thinking that it is a staph BKC, it may actually flare up the disease. So uh, BKC in an eye which is unduly watery or congested uh, could ar arouse a suspicion of uh, HSV-related problem. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think sir was the first person to at least tell me like to use gefluconazole for microsporidial keratitis but whenever there are some new things like new infections uh, arise like uh, during that uh, epidemic thing sir used to call and tell us like uh, use this for fluconazole the typical pictures everything and um, uh, I want to ask a question on this like um, in case of early presentation of adenoviral or like maybe it is not an adenoviral, early case of uh, uh, conjunctivitis with uh, minimal ASP case. So do you like, uh, do, uh, like uh, prefer uh, to scrape the lesion and then uh, see and then give the uh, specific drug or like uh, we can add a, a fluconazole along with the acevir and then prescribe like uh, whether if it is not clinically Differentiate, uh, uh, differentiated like SPKs are uh, uh, maybe it is a adenoviral or it is a, a microsporidial. It is for like it's a question for the ink uh, ophthalmologist. Radhika, ma'am. Well, uh, if you see the case as typical as uh, what Professor had shown, I think the stuck on appearance is a dead giveaway. Okay. 
So there are two ways of thinking. One is it's typical, so you can just give symptomatic treatment or uh, you can try a nasone. But sometimes, uh, uh, you know, to demonstrate it also, when you remove it, scrape it off, then you're removing most of the uh, surface uh, infection. So it tends to do a debulking of the infection also. But to answer your question, in a typical case, every time you don't have to uh, remove and put it under the microscope to diagnose uh, uh, surface microsporidiosis. Stromal microsporidiosis, yes, you need to scrape and find out. It's a totally different ball game. It's not a self-limiting disease. But for uh, epithelial, uh, scraping is not required unless you want to prove something or uh, you feel that the scraping is going to debulk the disease. I wanted to just ask one question please. Limit and nowadays I will see a lot of patients being referred and patients are cosmetically uh disturbed because of that how early should we treat them and like uh, what is your experience and what how common do you see recurrence in these patients you're asking me dr christy yeah yeah yes ma'am yeah so limbal dermoid basically uh we know that it's a congenital teratoma kind of a condition so the treatment entirely will depend on whether there's a visual reason or whether the parent wants it so like Professor again uh, put across these patients, we should start examining from the time before we put them on the slit lamp to look for, uh, you know, associated uh, syndromes and stuff. Because, uh, you know, those patients probably will need lid oculoplasty and other consults also. But if we just have a, a limbal domoid, uh, if it is causing uh, amblyopia either because of uh, a large size or if it is causing significant astigmatism or difficulty in lid closure, then uh, we need to remove it. Otherwise, if the parent feels that it's a cosmetic blemish, then we remove it. And the one point about removal, since you mentioned the so-called recurrence, uh, I do not believe that there is a true recurrence of dermoid. Quite often what happens is it's an encapsulated lesion. And uh, if we don't excise it in total, and if the capsule gets breached, then it can uh, give rise to a very florid granulomatous uh, healing response. And that is what uh, you know looks like a recurrence, which can be far worse than the original problem. So excising it along with the uh, capsule will form the mainstay of the treatment. And in a very large dermoid, uh, it may help if we can have investigation to know the depth of involvement so that if we find that underlying cornea or the sclera is very, very thin, which can happen in occasional cases, we can keep a patch graft ready. So these are the small tips that I follow to treat a limbal dermoid. And another thing as removing surgically may not address the amblyopia problem as such. So as uh, Sir mentioned, we have to do refraction early, even if we delay the surgery, we have to do the refraction and uh, the other occlusion therapy and other things should be started very early in these patients. Yes, sir. And uh, another case, Sir has shown uh, rhinosporidiosis with the underlying uh, choroidal show. Uh, like, um, whether we have to uh, like uh, look for the poke, the increase in size of the uh, is, uh, that uh, choroid like uh, like in uh, every visit like sir has said only conservative management in most <coughs> cases so whether we have to measure and then document in every visit and how often we have to document and then is there any risk of uh, retinal detachment in future so that we have to whether we have to explain it to the patient uh, before on the contrary, uh, because sir used to tell us always not to touch that. So that's the dictum I also follow. But here, uh, my other colleagues from Retina Cora, this one, uh, you, they'll be insisting on doing yes. some uh, patch graft. Patch graft. Uh, and um, of course, I have never done. And when it was done in one or two patients, they ended up with a retinal detachment. I mean, it occurred after the patch graft. I don't know. Maybe I remember. Uh, reading an article, I think, from Joseph I Hospital or something, that uh, you have to do some cautery or something on this for eye, then do the yeah. patch. Otherwise, if you just press it and try to do, you may end up with other uh, posterior segment problems. I don't know, maybe Sriram or somebody can uh, say whether they have handled such cases. Another thing, we have to send them to ENT surgeons to rule out any nasal or uh, sinus uh, rhinosporidiosis, which has to be addressed. Otherwise, it can be recurrent. 
Yeah. Um, can I just add a simple point? Uh, sorry to jump in, but it's an absolute favorite uh, topic. Every one slide yeah. that uh, Professor presented, you know, you can talk for uh, hours or discuss for hours. <laughs> the thing is that in contrast to other infective scleritis, rhinosporitis is basically a conjunctivitis. It is a conjunctival involvement. And while sitting on the sclera, because of some kind of inflammatory response, it kind of dissolves the sclera. It's not a primary infective uh, scleritis. So once, uh -huh, so once the conjunctival lesions are gone, what is the threat? There is no infective threat over there. The only threat that is there is the staphyloma. So mm -hmm. the staphyloma, what will happen to the staphyloma? Either if there is pressure from inside like glaucoma or if there is pressure from outside like trauma, then you can have a problem with that uh, staphyloma. So if we can keep both absolutely under control, the IOT is under control, the patient wears a rigid shield at night and, you know, is not a boxer or anything like that, then we can observe, uh, uh, you know, cautiously. But suppose we find that intraocular pressure is not under control, the staphyloma is increasing, it's, it's very scary to do these surgeries because these are fully sighted patients like Sir pointed out. In that case, then we have to do a patch graft and I've learned from Dr. SKR himself that when you do the cautery, it cannot be on the uvea. You will cause a hole. You will develop a dental detachment. So you have to identify those scleral fibers on top and put low cautery on them for shrinkage rather than cauterize the staphylomites. And I, go, I hope I got that point right from you all those years. Basically, we published an, a series of these patients where the staphyloma is a weak point. So I think if you can fix it, we should. It's not just a cosmetic blemish, but it is a weak point. Some straining, some minor trauma can cause it to go. So if you have an active rhinosporidiosis, that conjunctiva is excised. But if it is the lesion that you're seeing after the rhinosporidiosis is gone, like Radhika said, if you can open the conch on top of the staphyloma, you will always have scleral fibers across it. It never melts the sclera completely. So you use, if possible, diathermy. Cautery is what we use if you, can, if you don't have, but if you have access to diathermy, that's a lot safer. That's what the retinal surgeons use. The only thing to remember is that when you're shrinking this, it's going down, the volume increases. So you must have a parasynthesis and you must keep releasing the aqueous at periodic intervals. So as you keep shrinking the staphyloma, you will have to release the aqueous to maintain the pressure in the eye. And the, in the ones that you've done, both the congenital ones and the, we've never had a retinal detachment if you follow these principles. And if you don't perforate at any point, you should be fine. If you just put a patch of sclera over this and support it, then you'll have a white bulge instead of a black bulge. So you definitely have to flatten the staphyloma before you repair it. It's not a very complicated surgery. These eyes do quite well. And uh, I don't know, Mr. Ram can chip in. But I feel that if you don't go through the choroid at any one point and cause a retinal break, you should not have a problem. We never did in our series. They did very well. Uh, thank you, sir. I don't have any experience of treating patients like this, but one thing from what you said is, sir, if you're using diathermy instead of cautery, one way it might be helping is diathermy itself is going to produce a very good retinochoroidal adhesion, mm -hmm. like what uh, you, they used to do in olden days for scleral buckling surgery. Even though diathermy burns were spaced well apart compared to what a cryo or laser burn, those few burns are enough to nail the retina and choroid down. Maybe that is what was really helping your cases and not develop the retinal attachment. That was this, that's my thought, sir. Yeah, even that paper from Joseph also mentioned that only, not cautery. It was diathermy. Yes, ma'am. Because cautery will lead only to shrinkage. It will not really. It will lead to necrosis of the tissue and not uh, retinochoroidal addition. Even in the retina, when we do cautery, it only leads to necrosis of coagulation and necrosis of tissue. Whereas a diathermy will lead to more addition and the diathermy addition is the strongest known. It's much more than cryo and laser. Ma Radhika, ma'am, do you then give uh, anti-glaucoma medications throughout uh, in, those, in these patients? Even before the anti-glaucoma medication, on table there is one more point uh, uh, I, I would like to address, which is common to all uh, patch grafts, which is uh, uh, covering the graft adequately with uh, a pedicle of uh, conjunctival tissue. Because if we don't do that, Instead of the rhinosporidiosis melting the sclera, uh, the lack of blood supply will immediately dissolve that uh, graft, leading to more complications. So we need to, you know, cover it back one way or the other, give it some um, you know, vascular uh, supply. No, the answer is no, Dr. Anita. Empirically, I will not give. If there is an indication, because I always believe that staphyloma begets staphyloma in other conditions. Forget rhinosporidiosis. If you see an anterior staphyloma, Staphyloma leads to glaucoma, glaucoma leads to increase in staphyloma, and we've seen that cycle happen a lot of times. So if something like that is setting in, then probably anti-glaucoma medication. We're lucky here because a lot of outflow mechanism is uncompromised in these situations, so the meds will work. 
But if I find the IOP is controlled and you've done an excision and the patch graft is well in place, I think more of the uh, pressure control needs to be done on table like Dr. SKR pointed. I was a bad student. I knew that point also, but I did not come out at that time. So you need to kind of uh, do that parasynthesis uh, intraoperatively. Postoperatively, only if the IOP is not under control, I would consider anticorpo medication. But then it also remains that when you have a weak spot and you compress like that, then pressure may shoot up. So short-term till glass appointment, I may uh, give medication, but not longer than that. Sir, uh, like time is uh, 6.44. Yeah. Like, yes. uh, yeah. Last question, can I ask that? For the... no, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, sir, I, um, uh, to the panel, like, uh, we, have, we are giving a tricot injection supratorsal. Uh, and uh, how often uh, do you uh, come across uh, glaucoma with this uh, tricot? And I also know like Revati Ma'am is giving uh, supratorsal DECA, DECA injections to avoid a glaucoma. So uh, with tricot, like uh, you, uh, you see uh, like often like uh, raised IOP like uh, after uh, one month or, or a chronic rise in IOP is there. Because RK sir is there, I, I, I thought I will finish this with glaucoma topic. <laughs> Because you treat most of these people before you go on to an injection, you will have a chance to assess whether they are a steroid responder or not. Mm -hmm. Because you often have them on topical steroids for any length of time before you decide to. Nobody gives a steroid injection as the first line of management. So basically, then you decide if there is no steroid response, I would prefer dexamethasone because it acts for a shorter period of time as opposed to tricot, which may last for two to three months. And if you give, if you then, if you know there's a st steroid response, then you have to take a call in conjunction with a glaucoma colleague as to how important this injection is. If the surface is really desperately in need of it, then you have to do it and they will have to manage the steroid spike until the effect of the steroid goes away. But if it is not so important, then maybe you move on to something else and avoid the steroid injection. Tricot, I would avoid because that stays there for a long time. And the only advantage of it is you can excise it if you really want to because you can see the crystals there, but it's right in the back and it's not so easy as a subcontinent. I mean, a peri -lim peri limbal tricot is easy to excise and get rid of. This is hidden right under the lid. So like madam, I would prefer dexamethasone. It lasts for three weeks. And if it doesn't work by then, then you have to move to other strategies anyway. Thank you, sir. Uh, Christine, you want to ask anything? No, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, so really, it's a, a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, Discussion. Uh, we talk, we must, uh, uh, still, we can ask Radhika before we can discuss uh, so many each and every uh, right we can discuss. Uh, but in a short period of time, we have given an uh, overview of all the pathology of the IT segment. Really, it's uh, very nice, and uh, of course, we have learned a lot. It's uh, really it's, uh, but thank you, thank you very much, sir. And also, it's a wonderful uh, panel uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Rao, Radhika, really, uh, really uh, amazing. And uh, also, the moderator, uh, Anita and uh, Christy. And really, very happy. Thank you, thank you very much. And I, as a customer, I have to ask for the uh, uh, AIC chairman, Dr. Radhika, to propose what happened. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, special thanks to uh, uh, MS, sir, for the wonderful talk. It was a, a photo bouquet of uh, cases. It was literally like a PG update program for consultants. Mm -hmm. Amazing, sir. It was uh, wonderful to see the pictures and uh, a few of the comments were uh, amazing. Don't go with the flow. Think and do is what I learned today from uh, what uh, sir was uh, saying. Just because someone else is using, <coughs> you also don't. Think if it is needed and then do. Uh, lots and lots of uh, teaching and uh, learning, sir. Thank you so much for uh, sparing your uh, uh, precious time for us. I'm sure uh, YouTube, uh, there will be a lot of views for this session after uh, afterwards. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, thanks to uh, 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 SKR, sir, uh, Radhika, madam, and uh, Revati, madam, for all the wonderful uh, inputs. And uh, special thanks to uh, Anita, madam, and uh, Dr. Christie for wonderfully moderating the session. And uh, heartfelt thanks to Ramakrishnan, sir, for having come up with this session. Sp thanks to Aurolab for having supported this uh, program. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you, Atik. Thank you. Thank you, Atik. Okay. Just one word. I think I think still many in this panel still consider themselves either as a species of fellows. Correct, Devi, madam. So now whether your audience is going to go back and revisit, I am definitely going to revisit the talk back in YouTube. I'm sure. Whenever you talk with the MSR or listen to one of his talks, you always feel that again you'll go back to your student life. Not exactly, ma'am. Immediately you will get so many new points. You'll go and uh, again read or, uh, you know, you, you try something new. It, it's like that only. Mm -hmm. Always. Atiyah, you have seen this, na, this month, I journal. Did you read? Not yet, sir, but you've inspired me to do uh, that. The two, <laughs> uh, especially after librarian to send the whole text. The two, one is uh, ocular lymphoma, another one is <laughs> ISSM. Yes, Very I'll do that. So how the surface uh, treatment uh, helped in the resolution and how the OCD proved it? Like a textbook. Uh, I'll do that and revert to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ram. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.